stand clear. 100% Wild Podcast. So for all you listeners, hello and welcome to Definitely Not Your Favorite Outdoor Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Drury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. We're powered by DeerCast. Next to me, Matt Drury. And next to me, Tim Chelswick. Ain't no place that I'd rather be next to you. Sit next to me. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. A little Shenandoah throwback. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is episode number 306, and we've got a lot to cover today. We've got a tripod coyote. We've got a chance to win big. Mm. I'm intrigued, Tim. We've got a very biological wildlife word. We got some cool shout outs. I think we have to re- relabel it to the wildlife phrase. Yeah, the, you lose it's the never alliteration. A word. It's the problem. <laughs> this week it's a word. Oh, <laughs> oh of course. So. I've been thinking of that for three years. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> Well, Uh, never mind, Tim. I'll keep my thoughts to myself. Next week, hit me with it. Okay. (laughs) Wait a minute. This is a phrase. And, uh, yeah, so we got a big show. We're going to be talking about wildlife photography, specifically how to get in close and capture some great images of whitetail dur. Huge. Huge. All right. It's going to be great. Let's do it. You know, I... uh, I kind of feel like I've like officially put up the white flag for last season because I'm out there taking down my cameras right now. <laughs> you just now I, put out the white flag, jeez. I, I, I don't want. I, <laughs> Welcome to 2023, Tim. We sucked in 22. <laughs> <laughs> News flash. Um, one of my buddies just got contacted though about DMAP and going through and doing some whitetail har- uh, some selective whitetail harvest here in March oh. uh, via the Department of Conservation. Really? Mm-hmm. On his yep. own property, uh, ground that he's leased. They contact the land. They contacted the landowner. Is it a CWD county? Yes. Yeah, that's a slippery slope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it's kind of a catch twenty two. He does need some venison for the freezer. And Is he it would, really DMAP though? If it's under that CWD? I, yeah, I guess. I guess it's DMAP with the express purpose of limiting CWD. Yeah, I mean they want to exterminate the in that instance. So he's kind of he's kind of in a catch twenty two because it's like if he doesn't do it, they're gonna do it. Yeah, and he doesn't really want to do it, but he would rather have some influence over his deer hunting destiny. Man, that's a tough. Uh, there's a lot of people I know in our hometown of St. Genevieve, Missouri, uh, w- where we all grew up. Uh, Mark and Terry and myself. That that it's a CWD county, and boy, that is a hot button topic. <laughs> I it mean, that's sure is. you know because the the question is, if it was your place, what would you do? And I think all of us would say, well, I wouldn't want to kill my entire deer herd, and and then and then what? You know, so I. I don't know, man. I feel bad for the people that it happens to because if you're in it doing like what we do and it's kind of your identity as far as a wildlife manager and you're, you know, is it part of the management? Is it part of, you know, I'm talking kind of theoretically here. What, how do you look at it in that regard? If it's better for the the good of the overall herd, Mm -hmm. like the state herd, do you go and do it at the expense of your entire herd? Uh, I don't think many tough. people would say yes. I mean, many people yeah. are doing it. I mm-hmm. get it. But, I mean, if you're as ate up with it as, as, you know, the circle of people that we're friends with, you wouldn't want to kill your entire deer herd. No. No, plus, I, I don't know, deer hunting in March feels weird. Shooting a doe that's three months pregnant, that's... But that they mm-hmm. don't care. I mean, that's the, the whole thing. They just want to kill them all. Mm-hmm. It's It's just a very yeah. tough pill to swallow if that's your ground yep yeah very much so but we've got a native born texan on the show this week oh yeah oh yeah all right yeah so uh so we're talking with our buddy lance kruger lance is dialing in from texas this week lance how are you i'm good so thanks for having me yeah, yeah yeah thanks for being had so on instagram you are you are constantly knocking it out of the park with these incredible whitetail fo- turkey like you cover a lot of wildlife but whitetails are kind of your uh your wheelhouse so take us back to because we're going to talk about how you get in close the equipment 
kind of how you get access to these. Pro We're going to talk about all that stuff, but I'm curious in your origin story, like how did you get started in wildlife photography? Well, back in uh, 1985, when I was 16 years old, my dad started managing a ranch here in South Texas. Um, and I was uh, had my first job, bought a camera and a lens specifically to photograph wildlife out at the ranch. And they had you know, exotic animals. They had, um, the owner hunted Africa and all over the place and, and wanted, you know, wildlife on his ranch that, you know, he had hunted and he, he had ostrich zebras. He even had rhinoceros on his ranch, Whoa. black rhinoceros, uh, um, had a lot of really cool stuff. And I, I photographed all that stuff and photographed, you know, whitetails out there. And that, you know, the whitetails was what I was very interested in, uh, not so much the exotics. And so, I started photographing out there. Uh, he told me about a couple other places here in South Texas to photograph. I started shooting photos at those places and people started telling me that my photos were really, you know, like magazine worthy, like stuff they would see in the magazines. And, and so, I'm sorry. We, we should probably, just for, for the sake of, for all generations listening, we, what you're talking about, Lance, is back then shooting on a camera that took film. That was a film camera. That was a Canon A one program camera that took film, and I shot slide film, which is much more difficult to expose for because you have to be real exact on the exposure. And um, yeah, so I've shot since I was film uh, shooting film back in 1985. Manual focus cameras. There was no auto anything other than <laughs> the exposure. But the guy that mentored me, Steve, Dr. Steve Benson, who's a professional photographer. Um, he told me not to run anything on automatic to run the exposure full manual. So I set the aperture, okay. shutter speed, ISO, everything manual myself. Not, there was no screen readout. I had to shoot a roll of film and send it in and get the film back two weeks later to find out if I got anything yeah. or not. That, that, that's so crazy because right now it, it doesn't take anything for someone to go around with a DSLR and just ta -ta 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 and pick one out of the 35 pictures they just took. But back then you had to be judicious and it cost you money to get that film developed to see what, what it looked like and you didn't have that real-time feedback that you do now. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, the thing is, I was, you know, 16 at the time. I, you know, my parents didn't, you know, pay for my cameras, my film, anything. I had, you know, when it wasn't deer season, mm -hmm. I was, you know, going and in, in mowing yards and stuff like that to be able to pay for film in the off season when I was in school, because I was still in high school at the time. And so I would, you know, make enough money to buy a roll of film one week huh. and the next week I would have enough money to develop it. So it was like <laughs> a two week turnaround for me <laughs> to find out. I couldn't see immediately on the back of the screen, like the DSLRs and the mirrorless cameras of today yeah. where you get instant feedback and see you, where you can take a test photo and say, Oh, it's too dark or it's this or that. Right. You had to, you know, shoot it and just pray that it turned out all right. You know? So it was, it was kind of a, a scary type deal, not knowing what you were getting, but you know, people were saying, man, your photos are really good. And, and um, I started, I waited three years before I started uh, sending any photos in and started, uh, sent my first photos in when I was 19, year, 19 years old, when mm -hmm. I was uh, three years later, and uh, got six photos published in that first magazine inside. And uh, it kind of went from there. And, it, and by the time I was 21 years old, I uh, was part-time professional. And by 24, I was full-time professional. And uh, the day after I uh, graduated from college. It was, I graduated in December. I flew out to Montana on assignment for a magazine and, uh, you know, photographed mule deer out there. And I've been traveling ever since. So that's, wow. you know, been, I've been shooting photos for 30, uh, I'm 53 now. So 30 something years, whatever that is, um, 37 years I've been shooting photos, been doing it professionally for like 31. Well, from, and from what I know from some of the, the OGs that were, uh, outdoor writers and outdoor photographers, that was really big business. And those paychecks were pretty significant b back in the day, writing and, and and doing photography for these big outdoor magazines. And I don't know if it's, if it's the same anymore because there's just so much content and it hits so quick. But back in the day, it used to be a pretty, pretty lucrative from what I understand. It was. And uh, I, that's how I made my living. Uh, 100% was through the magazines, uh, through either selling photos to Field and Stream and Outdoor Life and the other hunting magazines, selling them photos for the use on their cover yeah. uh, or for inside photos to illustrate articles. 
uh, that writers would, you know, write and not, you know, they might not have the quality of photos that they need. Uh, but then also selling to the manufacturers photos for advertising in those magazines and for print brochures, catalogs, trade show displays, at SHOT Show, ATA, stuff like that. That's how I made my living for, you know, a majority of my living for, you know, 20 something years. And uh, the magazine market, unfortunately, because of social media and the Internet and what we're doing right here has you know, kind of killed the magazine market. And the eyeballs are no longer on magazines like they used to. Um, and so eyeballs are going to phones. And so I'm having to adjust and my income because the magazines are either, you know, have either, you know, cut back on pages, uh, making a thinner magazine, uh, cutting photo budgets back, uh, going to um, where, you know, they may be cutting back issues like Field and Stream and Outdoor Life. When I first started selling to them were 12 issues for Outdoor Life, 12 issues for Field and Stream. Mm -hmm. Now they're, they're, they went down to uh, four and four. They were quarterly magazines, and now they don't even print magazines anymore. It's totally online, just an e-magazine, a digital magazine. So uh, income for photographers has really been, you know, cut back with the, um, with the uh, you know, magazines, you know, going out of business. I mean, I was afraid Field and Stream and Outdoor Life, the oldest, biggest magazines in the world, were going to, you know, go out of business. But they got bought out by a company that does digital type stuff, and uh, they, they're making a digital magazine now. But, uh, you know, a lot of others like Harris Publications that I used to sell to, Whitetail Hunting Strategies and some of the others, they went out of business. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, cut the, the bottom line uh, for me. And so I'm trying to reinvent myself, I guess you could say, trying to find other ways to make money yeah. and, you know, other ways to make money with my photos with my cameras and with my knowledge about photography and, and white-tailed deer and turkeys. And we'll make sure that we link up your Instagram profile in the show notes. If folks want to go give you a follow, it's, it's, you're definitely worth a, a follow on Instagram. Um, but yeah. And, and so like, also I, I'm, I'm sure you probably see this, like people are just right clicking and saving and like, it's hard. I, I would imagine it's hard to be a photographer and have an online digital business <laughs> Especially because people are, it's so easy to screenshot and just like, I, we, we see it with Jury Outdoors, people rip off our content pretty frequently and just post it as their own. By the way, we're aggressively <laughs> searching those people out we'll go and, get them. and asking them to not use it. <laughs> so what do you do in, in those instances? Well, it depends on what it is. Um, if it's a big company, then I may get my copyright attorney to go after them. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's, uh, and I've actually had companies all over the world use my photos illegally. Um, I've actually discovered some at the shot shows that I've been to in Ooh. the past. And, you know, like a Japanese rifle scope company was using my photo in, as their bird trend display at the, at the shot show in their booth and on their brochures. And, you know, I ended up having to hire international uh, copyright attorneys to go, you know, to deal with that. Uh, but if it's, you know, some little guy just posting it on his page, you know, I'll just ask him to just, you know, please stop, you know, mm -hmm. stop using it. And, um, you know, like some people, you know, it's funny because some people will ask for, you know, can you, you know, take out the copyright? Because I always put my name and copyright symbol on it. Yeah. And so that's to kind of keep the honest guy honest, you know, uh, the honest thief honest, I guess you could say. <laughs> and so I'm always trying to, you know, just be nice about it. But if they're making money off of it, then that's money that they made off of something that I could make money off of that I would have charged them for if they had yeah. come to me in advance. Um, and so, you know, it's one of those things where I just got to, you know, see what the situation is and just decide what the best, you know, tactic is to go after them. And it's tough because, you know, in social media, you know, I think it's widely known that if you're giving photo credit, you know, an at tag in the caption or you tag them in the photo, like that's kind of a way to give, you know, to, to, to say, Hey, I'm using this person's photo and it's almost become widely accepted. But like you said, if the company or the person is taking it one step further and making money off of it, it's a whole different level. So it's one thing to share somebody's content, which has become widely accepted, especially if you credit them. It's another thing to, use somebody's content, not credit them, and somehow you're making money off of their work. That's that's the the level we're talking here and that's where it gets really sticky and and I don't think 
a lot of people, especially the younger generation, I don't think they have any idea that this, they just kind of view everything on the internet as free, mm-hmm. you know, and it's a hard business lesson uh, a lot of times when they're using content that's not their own. Yep. And like you said, I mean, sometimes it's a little guy and they just don't know any better. You ask them nicely, hey, you know, can you take that down? Or, you know, we, we request you to give us permission. But if it's, a, if it's an actual company using it, to make money in some way, you know, advertising their product or doing something, you know, using your image and somehow advertising their product. That's a different level. You you can't allow that to, to, to pass. Yeah. And what, what's really interesting is things that my business has changed a lot with me previously just selling to magazines and manufacturers and companies that wanted to use my photos on their, you know, on their product or their package or whatever. Um, I, I was very, very careful about who got to see my photos. Only photo editors got to see my photos, um, uh, graphic artists, you know, uh, uh, advertising agencies, stuff like that. And nobody else really got to see my photos. And so then came social media. And I started doing social media back in 2017, the, the, like October 2017, five years ago. And um, I found out that it's a different world and that it's okay for people to share your stuff and you want people to share your stuff where before I was, nobody saw my stuff. I didn't want anybody to share my stuff because I wanted to be paid for that because that's how I provided for my four kids and, you know, put them through diapers early on in my career. And now I'm putting them through college at this stage of my career. And so I'm trying to learn this young man's business and trying to change at 53 years old. And, you know, I'm learning from my kids. My kids are the ones that yeah. set up my Instagram and help me with my first post. And so, you know, I'm, I'm too young to retire, but too old to know this young man's game. And mm. so I'm trying to learn. And so I've gotten to, you know, on my Instagram, I got 67,000 followers and, you know, that's surprising to me because I thought, The only people that would want to follow my stuff is, you know, my, my five, you know, my wife and my four kids. (laughs) I thought I'd have like five followers, you know? So then when I started getting all these people and, you know, I started growing like 10,000 a year, 12,000 a year, it's like, man, this is really bizarre. And so I started seeing the power of social media um, and having people share it, you know, share your photos. And I've got, Mm -hmm. you know, friends of mine that are photographers that aren't making the change over. And so, you know, they're not, they, they can't understand letting somebody use your photo on their page and, you know, sharing your photo and you getting some benefit out of that. They think of just, they need to make X number of dollars off that use. Yeah. But amazing, I've tried yeah. to change my mindset and, you know, know that that's going to get my photo in front of more people, build my following. And then from that following, and cause you don't get paid anything through Instagram, Instagram doesn't pay you for you know, using your photo, you know, or your, your audience or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to make money off of, you know, those followers that are interested in what you, what you're doing and what things you can offer. Like I do calendars now, which I didn't do so that people could buy stuff. I I want to do a book. I do uh, photo workshops that I call my, my up close and uh, uh, master classes that I give. And so that's, you know, things that you've got to offer that, you know, you can make money off of in in an indirect way rather than directly from the person that's using that photo. Well, to your point, I mean, I I mentioned off air that I've been a long admirer, but really in the scheme of things, it's just like you're saying, it's a few years of following you on social media. And I didn't know there was a whole backstory with you and Mark and Terry. Like I had no idea, but as the guy that's now kind of overseeing our, our marketing efforts and and those types of things, I I've mentioned several times internally, it's like, man, if we need an image, uh, a really pretty, you know, Midwest whitetail free range, like here's the guy we should connect with. Well, I only heard of you, of you because Mossy Oak shared your content, you know, on social media. So to exactly to your point, it's a way to potentially get new business. Um, and, and even your point about, you know, Instagram, not paying you, they are actually starting to, if you were to get into doing reels, you know, taking your images and, and, and creating a video reel out of your images and to a, a song or something that they allow you to use, but they, you know, there are ways, but it's even that, I mean, it's not like that, that takes a lot of time and effort and, and, you know, hot content chicks. creation, <laughs> hot chicks. <laughs> yeah. So it's, that's a little bit tougher, but it, it still, it wouldn't pay you nearly what you're accustomed to 
if you know from the old days of of going to a magazine you know a publisher and, and saying hey i'll sell you these four images it probably doesn't pay near near that unless your following is huge or it goes viral so it that's a tough way you know they'll pay you but it's it's pennies on the dollar in the scheme of what you were used to making you know probably in the in the business so i uh, i applaud you because it's it's one of those old dog new tricks types of things where if you want to stay relevant you have to do these things and that's one of the the things internally we noticed a decade ago with social media it's like hey we, we need to get ahead of this curve now and, and start cultivating a following and and talking to this consumer and and the platforms in, in which they use or else we're going to be left in you know the dust and and because we've done that you know we between deercast and all the social media platforms you know it's a several million followers but it's because yeah. we started 10 years ago or even more now at this point. So it's, it's, um, it's interesting how, you know, you have to evolve and and change with the times. Very true. And actually I'm in the process of doing that even beyond my still photography. I'm actually just this year started shooting video. And that's something that, you know, I, I did a little bit, you know, for different hunting shows on the outdoor channel and different uh, TV shows in the past where they wanted me to be a cameraman. And I would shoot, you know, the old high eight uh, video camera, you know, tape type, you know, digital uh, media way back when. And uh, but now I'm gearing up to do it for myself because I never shot video for myself. But with Instagram and TikTok all wanting video, I'm having to make that change. And that's part of, you know, at this stage of my life, you know, uh, of my career, changing over to shoot more video. And thankfully, with the newer mirrorless cameras that are out nowadays, um, you can switch back and forth pretty fast, at least with Canon. Nikon, yeah. you can't so much, uh, but with uh, Canon and Sony, you can switch over just by pushing one button and be going from stills to video instantaneously. Yeah. So I'm I'm just now gearing up. I changed up my whole camera assist, all my lenses I've changed up. I've sold all my old lenses that I've used since, you know, the 300 millimeter 2.8 lens and a 500 millimeter F4 lens which I had used that setup since the mid 1990s mm. and, you know, different generations of the lenses, newer versions with image stabilization and all autofocus and all that kind of stuff from manual focus lenses. But I have, you know, used that system of that two lens system for, you know, what was it? 25, 30 years, something like that. And just this year I sold both of those lenses, the, my 300 and I had two 500s. I sold all that. I sold all my DSLRs and now all the cameras that I own are mirrorless cameras Mm -hmm. and they are different lenses, focal lengths and apertures specifically to be able to shoot stills and videos together. Cool. So I want to dive into how you kind of embed yourself into these situations because your imagery, I always thought about this when you, you know, watch the discovery channel or not geo or something that, you know, you see the footage of, animals doing wild things and it's Bob like cat chasing a vole it's like how in the hell did this camera Marty guy Stauffer was huge on that yeah how how did this camera guy put himself in a position to capture these images or mm-hmm. video so i think i think that's probably what our audience would be as as interested in as anything how do you do what you do like how where do you how do you get yourself into these positions how long do you need to wait out there what are you in box blinds ground blinds just out next to a tree like what's the setup here gps coordinates <laughs> Well, uh, what, what you are asking me is something that I cover in my Whitetail Dream Bucks Up Close Masterclass that takes me four days to basically teach. But since we only have, what, you know, an hour here, um, I will break it down and suffice it to say that I use ground blinds a lot. Hmm. And one of my dreams as a kid was to be able to be invisible. And so... I, start, I started trying to figure out how can I get up close to whitetail deer. I remember thinking, okay, you know what would be incredible is if I could be a whitetail deer myself and walk around with them and they wouldn't know that, you know, I'm a whitetail deer. But I didn't want to get shot if I was a buck and I didn't want, if I was a doe, I thought, well, then I'll be a doe. But then I didn't want to get screwed by a whitetail buck. So I was like, man, I'm not... I'm not going to, I don't scared. want to do this white tail deer thing. So how can I be a fly in the wall in the white tails world? And so that's when I started using blinds and testing blinds uh, and ground blinds to be on eye level with the deer. Hmm. 
And so I, you know, used blinds for many years. Um, but the, you know, and that took care of one of the, you know, I call a, a white-tailed deer's head uh, their their uh, danger detection system. And so they, you know, with that head, it's on a, a, a swivel all the time. They've got their eyes, their ears, and their nose all right there together. And so I I overcame their eyes by using the blind and uh, by using the techniques to black out inside the blind and basically become invisible. Um, but I still had their ears and I had their nose to deal with. And so I started using ozone uh, back in 2011 wow. and that helped me out with the, you know, I used Scentlock before that, which was a lot of work to recharge the suits. I would have to take a shower twice a day with scentless soap and recharge the suits every you know, uh, twice a day, every morning before I went out in a, a dryer to, you know, re, mm -hmm. you know, to, because I was, they said that you could, you know, what they would last like three weeks or six weeks or something without recharging it. But I was like over the top on, you know, how much I needed to do because I had deer downwind of me at 20 yards away with the cameras. I'm not at a hundred yards away. Like people think or 200 yards or 500 yards with these big lenses you see behind me, I am 20 to 30 yards for most of my photos. So if I had a deer downwind of me, I knew that they were going to smell me. So I would have to recharge the suits twice a day. I, I was taking everything to the next level, but you couldn't, you couldn't take care of the scent on the, on your camera bag sitting in the blind with you or on your lenses, you couldn't spray them down with, you know, scent killer or whatever. So, uh, back in 2011, when I discovered ozone, uh, you know, the, the wonders of that, I started using that and had incredible success. And so I would have deer downwind of me, perfectly downwind, 20 yards away, and they wouldn't, you know, detect that I was there. So I took care of the nose situation. So I didn't have to worry about wind direction like I used to, because with a photographer, it's even more important which way you're looking for your sun angle and background, mm -hmm. which a lot of times I had to go with the wind, which was the wrong side for the, the sun and the background that I wanted to try to photograph a deer. So that took care of the, the nose part. And so then I had the other problem of the ears of the deer. And the cameras, especially the professional, really fast cameras, are extremely loud. They sound like machine guns going off, especially when you got a deer at 20 yards or 15 yards away from you. And so Canon started coming out with some quieter cameras with their DSLRs, which helped, but it still spooked the deer. And a lot of times I'd only get like three shots and the deer would be turning inside out, running the other way. Mm -hmm. So with these new mirrorless cameras, that finally, I've just been using mirrorless for the last three years, finally it took care of the sound because of the electronic shutters where there's no sound whatsoever. Because sure. I, always, I always you know, envied the video guys that had no sound when they were shooting mm -hmm. video. Mm -hmm. Well, now finally as a still photographer, I can shoot silently and not spook the deer. So I've taken care of all three of those things. That's pretty interesting about the ozone because that's a that's a topic in you know amongst in hunting camp with your buddies or whatever. It's like ah, does it work? Does it not? You see it on social media. I think you know you'll see uh, um, somebody post like name the bi biggest gimmick uh, ever in the hunting industry. I just saw Man, a post true. like this the other day. Yeah, definitely that. But it, you know, ozone's one of those that you always sink control. Ozone's yeah. always a hot topic. And here you have no skin in the game as, as far as like you're not a TV producer because we always get the bad rap like, oh, you're or an influencer now. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, you're just doing it because you're getting paid to. You're somebody that relies on it for your business to, de you know, to go undetected in the field. And Ozone really helped you, you know, accomplish that goal. That's that's interesting to me. We've been saying it for yeah, a long time um, that it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I. I I don't get uh, paid. I, I don't even know if, who y'all sponsors are or any of that kind of stuff, but I, I don't know if I can say this or not, but it's o Ozonics is the brand that I use. Um, and I actually was sent one of their units back in 2011 when I basically say I discovered it. I was sent one of their, you know, I wasn't the creator of it. I discovered it for myself and for my business. And so I was sent one of these units by an ad agency that was wanting to get one of the uh, their units inside my photos because mm. magazines, you know, you can't as an advertiser, you can't pay for the cover of a magazine like Field and Stream and Outdoor Life. So I was kind of the gatekeeper that was the person that could potentially get 
their product on the cover of a magazine. And so when I used, used to do a lot of hunter photos, getting guys up in tree stands and doing photos of them, drawing bows back and aiming guns and stuff like that, um, they sent me one of these units to put in the photos as a prop. I wasn't even planning on using this thing. But I had a situation where I was at, at a, a property in Ohio in September. It was like in the 80s. It was super hot. I, would, uh, I had one blind set up uh, for a morning uh, spot. And, but my afternoon spot, the wind was all wrong for that. But I didn't, have, I didn't have a lot of days to be there. And so I couldn't let a blind soak for the amount of days that I needed because everything you know, on this property was elevated blinds or tree stands or whatever. Mm. So it wasn't set up for my type of photography, which is to be on ground level and eye to eye with these deer up close. Mm -hmm. And so I had this afternoon blind set up and I knew that the blind was all wrong. And I had been shooting hunter photos middle of the day after the morning photo shoot at another blind on another part of the property. And I knew that the wind was wrong and I, I was sweating and I was running late to get in there. I didn't, you know, even when it was so hot, I didn't want to put scent lock on top, even their thin stuff. Mm. And so I just got to the blind, got set up, soaked shirt. I mean, my, I was, it was so sweaty. I'm a big guy. I mean, I was soaked down to my underwear. That's how sweaty I was. And so, um, I sat there knowing, you know, this is a waste of time. And this, about an hour later, a white tail doe comes in, comes in downwind to me. And uh, it's right on the edge of this uh, cornfield and soybean field that uh, came together right there. She came in downwind to me, put her head up and smelled, snorted, blasted out of there. Then came uh, about a half hour later, a, a little two-year-old, little six or eight point came in. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he smelled me and took off also. But on the doe, the thing about her is in her left or right ear, I can't remember which, but she had like this light colored, like a black spot on her ear. And so... I remembered that that spot on her ear, and so nothing came in that day. And and supposedly, there, according to the landowner, there was the reason I had this blind here is because there was you know four or five mature bucks that were coming in in a batch of group at that place. Yeah. And um, so next afternoon, same situation. I shot hunter photos middle of the day, sweated like crazy, predominant wind direction, nothing had changed. And I was thinking the, the night before, okay. I'm not going to be able to sit in this afternoon spot. I've got to be productive every day. Every day that I'm there is costing mm -hmm. me money. Yeah. I've got to shoot photos or I'm not going to be able to sell them to the magazines. And so I remembered this scent thing this that I had, this Ozonics unit. And so I started watching you know, YouTube videos and looking at their website, trying to figure out how to use this thing. And here, you know, I was going to have to be using it just you know, 12 hours later or whatever it was. And so I found out how to use it, set it up over your head and which way to point it and all that. And so same scenario the next day, I shot in the morning at one blind, hunter photos middle of the day, soaked all the way down to my underwear, sweat the next uh, middle of the day, got into the blind late and didn't have time to shower and none of that kind of stuff. And the only difference was the wind was still blowing right at, you know, right at the field. Mm -hmm. And the only difference was I had this ozonics unit in the blind above my head. And in about an hour later, here comes that doe with a black spot on her ear. Comes in downwind to me, and I'm like, oh, crap. I know what's about to happen. Mm. She smells, and she picks her head up, and then she starts walking toward me. And I'm like, what is she doing? And she was like dead nuts downwind to me. I mean, 100% downwind, smelling me with her nose up. I've got photos of her with her nose up like that. Mm. And she came in, and then after smelling for about 10 seconds, five seconds, she went to feeding. It was just fine. Mm. That afternoon, I had those uh, that batch of group of bucks come in mm -hmm. that didn't come in the day before because she uh, snorted and spooked everybody off, and they fed in front of me for an hour, 20 to 40 yards, downwind, wow. perfectly downwind to me. And I have not sat in a blind since then without the Ozonics. Even if the wind is in the right direction where it's blowing in my face and I'm expecting them in front of me, mm -hmm. what about those does that are behind you or deer that come in behind you that will snort behind you. Mm -hmm. I want to. Yeah. I want to spook the, or I want to keep those deer from spooking behind me. I even use it when I'm turkey hunting. Think about it. How many times have deer gotten spooked off a field that you were trying to call in because some deer smelled you and snorted? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm trying to overcome those de the deer's noses, even when I'm turkey hunting with a turkey that really can't smell you very well, hmm. so or, or at all. Sure. So I use Ozonics in. Every time I'm sitting out, it doesn't work in some situation when you're stalking and different things like that. But for 
me and blinds, which is where I'm sitting 90% of the time, yeah. I've got an Ozonics unit running all the time. That's cool. You know, it's amazing the difference of that angle of being elevated in a blind or tree stand versus ground level and how big the deer looks at ground level. It's, it's a much, it's just a much better perspective, especially for what you're trying to do. You know, I just think of, you know, the few times I've had ground blind hunts and, and uh, white tails and, you know, at 20 yards, it's, it's a pretty incredible experience and much different than being in an elevated blind, mm -hmm. obviously. So as you go out and, and, you know, you're getting within 20 to 40 yards of all these whitetails. What's the biggest whitetail, free range whitetail that you've had in front of you? Because essentially you're, you're a great hunter in order to be this great photographer. I mean, are you talking typical or are you talking non-typical? Whatever. Just I mean, I've, biggest I, I photographed, you know, some, you know, low 200 class typicals uh, and some non-typicals that were in that two, 240 inch range, something like that. Um, so, you know, I've, I've photographed some big ones, but the thing is what you were saying before is I got, I get to get into places that nobody else gets to get into because I'm carrying a camera and I'm not, you know, trying to kill the, kill the deer. Yeah. And so I get in on, you know, the lady down the road that doesn't let anybody hunt her property and she's got, you know, 500 acres or a hundred acres or whatever. And those are her little babies, you know, and those are her little, you know, pets that she won't let anybody hurt. And she's got them all named or whatever the situation is. Mm. Or I get into, you know, uh, heavily managed places that, you know, don't, you know, they, it's like only family that hunts it or, you know, they, you know, only let their kids hunt or whatever. It's, it's strictly, you know, it's managed. They shoot a lot of deer off the place. Mm -hmm. And so I'm able with the camera, it opens up a lot of gates that I would never get into sure. if it wasn't, you know, for that. And so that's why I got into photography because, you know, we couldn't afford to hunt here in Texas because, you know, hunting in, in Texas for deer has always been, you know, a high dollar situation down here. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't have friends or family that would let us hunt. And so, we quail hunted and dove hunted. And then I got into photography when I was 16 because of that huge desire that I had to try to, you know, full white tail deer, be up close mm -hmm. to white tail deer. Yeah. And so that's, you know, that's how I've been able to, you know, I just got into it because I wanted to shoot photos like I saw in the magazines, mm -hmm. you know, that we used to subscribe to having no idea that I would one day be at the top of, of that game and be in the top white tail photographer for field and stream and outdoor life, you know, 15 out of 20 years that I, you know, that was a big run for me where I had more covers of white-tailed deer than anybody else. You know, like one fall, um, I had all four of the uh, white-tail covers with field and stream in one year, all the live white-tail covers. They ran four that year. That's, a you know, uh, like a third of the uh, photos that they ran on covers. I had all four of them. Another year, two years later, I had all the field and stream and all the other life covers. So, you know, I had no idea that me just wanting to shoot photos like I saw in the magazines – that I would, you know, be the guy that was supplying the magazine, you know, photos yeah. to the magazines to be able to get those things published. Well, just generationally speaking, I, I can remember <clears throat> my dad always had a North American whitetail subscription and it was a big deal whenever that magazine would come to the house. And it was inspiring. Like the cover was always inspiring no matter what time of year. It was like, oh my gosh, I, I'm, I'm a deer hunter. I want to kill a deer like that. I want to see a deer like that. Or even the magazine rack at the grocery store, you know, perusing, see what they had and stopping on, on a really big deer. And just, it was, it was jaw dropping. And, and I, I don't know if this current generation of young people will get to experience that quite in the same, you know, now it's, you're scrolling, scrolling, oh, you slow down because you see something like one of Lance's uh, pictures. But the, the other thing, Lance, I, I just, I want to, I want to make reference to here is I don't know that, people fully appreciate what an accomplishment it is to have made a full-time career in the outdoor industry. Because when I first started getting into outdoor writing and having stuff published, and I found a lot of people who were part-timing it, like the, their wives had the full-time job and the benefits and like very few guys are able to, very few people in general are able to do it full-time 
make a living, support their families. At a lot of people dabble in outdoor media, and you've been able to make a career and still going strong. So that that's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Well, I mean, my uh, you know my wife stayed home, and you know when we were in the baby making phases of a phase of our lives, we had four kids. Uh, she stayed at home, and and uh, you know it was a hundred percent off of my photography, but. Um, you know, she, you know, ended up going to work. She's a registered nurse and, you know, helping out with expenses and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. uh, which has helped me, especially through this, you know, tough times that, you know, I'm, you know, the magazines are, you know, going away yeah. in whatever aspect that is, whether, you know, fewer issues or going out of business. And so it's harder and harder. And so, you know, her income is, you know, huge to help out, you know, especially in, you know, this phase of our lives. But, uh, you know, now that we're putting kids through college and all that kind of stuff, too. But um, anyway, it's it's one of those things where most you'll find that most, uh, you know, full time professional photographers have wives that, you know, do, you know, help out in some regard. You know, Charlie Alzheimer, who was one of the you know, one of my top competitors for many years, very close friend of mine. Uh, his wife was a school teacher and, you know, he. He was, you know, at the top of his game, you know, before he passed away a few years ago. And so, you know, most, you know, most photographers, I mean, it's a hard way to make a living. Uh, yeah. There's, you know, so many people that, you know, try to do it on the weekends, you know, weekend warriors and, you know, retired guys and whatever. The problem they fall into is that they try to give their stuff away or give it away for cheap, you know, where they'll mm -hmm. say, well, I'll take what, you know, half of whatever Lance takes, you know, just to get my photos published uh, or they'll give their stuff away for free. Um, or I even had, uh, the editor, the photo editor, um, Tom Evans at, uh, North American whitetail back in the nineties, uh, went to lunch with him and Gordon Whittington and a bunch of the editors out there in Marietta, Georgia. And Tom told me he was a photographer also. That's how he got the job. And he told me, he said, Lance, you won't believe it, but I had a guy call me up and ask me, how much do I have to pay you to get my photo on the cover of North American whitetail magazine? And Tom said, well, we pay photographers for the use of their photos on the magazine. And he said, no, sir, you don't understand me. How much do I have to pay you to get my photo on the cover of the magazine? So when you've got photographers that are willing to give their stuff away for free or cut your prices in half or even pay to get their photos on the cover of a magazine, mm -hmm. it, it's a hard way to make a living. I mean, it's not, not the get rich kind of thing. I do it because I love it. It's a yeah. passion. Um, but I have minimum standards. I, I basically look at this as a business and I am a businessman that happens to be in the business of selling photos. I could be selling cars. I could be selling houses. I could be selling a multitude of things, but I happen to be in the business of selling my images. And so I have to go out and purchase, you know, or I have to go get my product, which is photos of white tailed deer and turkeys and bass and different things like that. And I treat it as a business. And I think that that's why I have been successful and be able to stay in this business and not go broke like all the weekend warriors are going to be by giving their stuff away for free or at half price or whatever. And so I have minimums and I have to tell a lot of people no, that they can't use my photos at the prices they're wanting to pay. And so I treat it as a business first and foremost. And the photographer side that's a secondary thing. I love shooting the photos. If I could, I, if I didn't have to sell my photos and just go out and photograph, that would be my dream. Mm. But to be able to do both I, or to be able to do that, I've got to be able to sell photos, make enough money to, you know, be able to, you know, get new camera equipment, you know, Feed all the kids. computers, all the different stuff, yeah. pay for trips, you know, all the, you know, cause I travel all of the United States and Canada, you know, Sometimes as much as six months of the year, I'm, I'm gone. Mm. Um, and so all that's expensive. Do you get and so I can't go and do that without, you know, making money off of it. Yeah. Do, do you get to hunt at all in that mix? I do hunt, um, but I love photography so much. I, I hunted a lot when I was younger, and I used to guide uh, when I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. And um, I would actually, you know – making you know have enough money saved up where i you know would be gone like for four months i'd leave in september wouldn't be back till mid -de mid december before christmas and i would spend two months photographing on the way to let's say michigan and then i would guide for a month and i would guide for three days and have four days off and i'd go photograph those other four days and then i would make enough money off of uh, guide money and tips that I could afford to get back to Texas. So it was like an all or nothing type situation <laughs> where I couldn't get wow. back if I didn't make enough money off the of tips and, and, and guiding. 
And so then I would take a month on the way back to Texas to photograph getting back home for Christmas. But um, I used to hunt um, a lot more. But like when I was younger, mm -hmm. we really didn't hunt deer because we couldn't afford it. Yeah. Um, when my dad was managing the ranch, I shot a, a doe out there when I was 16 years old. I uh, shot my first buck at 21, I think. Um, but it's just been, you know, where people were given, you know, giving me opportunities to hunt. And so now I love be, being behind the camera so much that with my four kids, I asked landowners, hey, would you mind, you know, when they offer me a hunt, could my kid, you know, could my son or my daughter come hunting? Yeah. Cool. And so I've handed it over to them because I want them to have the passion for it and the opportunity mm -hmm. to hunt, which I didn't have. And so my son and I just got done with uh, five days of hunting where he was trying to kill his first buck with a bow. He's 16 years old now, cool. and he's really into hunting whitetails. And we, we were on a thousand acre place down here in South Texas that, you know, they had, you know, a, like a hit list of bucks that we could potentially shoot. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw four of them, but none of them were within bow range. He could have shot them with a rifle because it was during rifle season. We were bow hunting. Mm -hmm. um, and he could have shot all four of those deer with a rifle. But he was so committed yeah. to the bow that he basically walked away with tag soup. And, you know, one of the deer that we, he could have shot was 165-inch 11 point. Wow. Uh, he passed on a, a, the last afternoon. He passed on a mid-150s 10 point that he could have shot with a rifle is 85 yards from us, but mm. it wasn't, wasn't a bow shot. You know, he's limited to point, you know, he's pulling back like 50 pounds. So he's limited to like 20 yards, 30 yards max. So anyway, so I give my opportunities to hunt to my kids, but man, I love to hunt. I mean, if they said, Hey, your son can hunt and you can hunt, I'd be all over it, but I wanted <laughs> to be there for his first bow yeah. hunt. So I guided him for the, the whole hunt. But um, you know, if I have the opportunity to hunt myself, I'll take it if my son, you know, can hunt, sure. you know, in that situation. Lance, I'm curious what what you what you may be seeing on social in terms of pictures that people are taking of deer, hero shots, whatever things that just make you cringe. Like, Ugh, I wish we weren't doing that right now. Um, well, I mean, it's obvious stuff. You know, tons out in deer. Um, I, I get kind of tired of everybody thinking you've got to get low and put the deer way above you i i like more um atmosphere type shots more wide shots uh shots that show more of the surroundings around the deer um i like to see more of the atmosphere um i like to see more interaction between you know the hunter and their deer and not so much of just the hero shot of the guy you know holding up the rack or even the others where the deer's stiff and the guy walks back about 10 feet behind it and acts like he's holding the antlers and stuff like that, even though he could never reach for it. So that's the kind of stuff that I, I don't like. I, I, I don't know if that answers your question, yeah, no. but uh, that's the kind of stuff that, that I'm not big, big on. And I just kind of roll my eyes at. But, yeah. you know, yeah, I'm not sure. going to stop it. So, sure. how, how are, you know, you can't say much about it. Real quick before we uh, move on, you were mentioning a story that you had from – back in the day with Mark and Terry and coon dog. Why, why don't you share that with us? A little turkey hunting story you had. Well, I was, uh, invited up. Uh, this was when, you know, Mark was, you know, still had the, the mad game calls and they were do, trying to do DVDs and videos. I think, I don't know if they even had a show at the time, but I think it was like the first year after they started doing videos for the Kiskies and, and, uh, they were trying to do a video, um, of me trying to kill a turkey. And so this was back in 2000, um, right turn of the century, the April afterward, it was Northeast Missouri. And um, it was coon dogs lease. I, I think it was, I'm not even sure. I think it was Union County or something right on the Iowa border, kind of Northeast. Uh, you probably, you know, been there, Matt. But yep. anyway, it was Mark. Uh, Mark was doing the calling. Your dad was carrying the video camera. Terry was carrying the video camera. It was this big, huge monster, like beta cam SP monster yeah. video camera and coon dog was there. And so it was like 1230 and, and Missouri, you got to quit at one o'clock. I don't know if that's still the case, it but is. back then that's what you had to do. And so we finally, you know, it was like opening day and we'd been striking a lot of different places and trying to get a, a turkey to respond finally at 1230. Mark heard these, you know, three gobblers and they were a long way away. And so I remember looking out over this farm and there was like this ditch kind of running through it that they thought that we could, you know, go down this, you know, kind of halfway dry creek bottom. 
And so we ended up going in that creek bottom trying to, you know, because it was probably 12 feet, you know, deep, something like that. And so we walked in the bottom of it until, you know, we, Mark felt like we were close enough to be able to go up on the edge of it. So Mark kind of scrambles up and slips up on the, the side. And, you know, it's like, you know, halfway wet and leaves all over it. Just like, you know, you take two steps up and make one step sliding back. We got up to the top of the edge and I was there behind Mark and I was much skinnier and much better looking and, and uh, you know, uh, much more in better shape back then. And so I was up there with Mark and we laid over on the on the top of the uh, the creek mm -hmm. uh, side and your dad was trying to desperately climb up the side with that 30 pound camera or whatever he had. And he was slipping and trying to, you know, he didn't have like one hand available to yeah. grab roots and stuff like that. And so basically he was fighting it. Well, these turkeys start coming in. It's three, three gobblers. First one's a big strutter. Mark, you know, whispers to me as I'm laying over on the, the side of the, the creek uh, uh, edge right there. And your dad's down there trying to climb up and coon dogs down there pushing his rear end, trying to push him up. <laughs> they could not get up. Uh, so anyway, so the turkey comes in, Mark tells me to shoot him, tells me to shoot the strutter. I pull the trigger, shoot him. And so basically all your dad got was video of my rear end shooting this right. turkey. All right. So tail fan. That's that kind of Terry's calling least, card. <laughs> Shitty video footage. <laughs> Well, to say the least, it didn't make the DVD or the TV show. And so anyway, that was uh, all he got was uh, Mark holding the turkey up uh, and it was flopping around. And at the time, you know, I, I think uh, Mark had shot a thousand or hundreds of, you know, gobblers at that point of his career back in 2000. Uh, he said that at that time he had uh, only shot five turkeys that were that big or bigger. Oh. It was a 25 pounder with inch and a quarter spurs that were real sharp. And, uh, you know, 10 and a half inch beard, just to really, you know, he, he figured it was probably a three, three year old, four year old bird, yeah, something cool. like that. And, um, anyway, biggest turkey of my life. And, uh, uh, I've got him mounted full strut up in my office and look at him every day and think of, uh, your dad, uh, Terry, you know, struggling, trying to get up that, uh, I could hear him below me and, and, uh, looking at the video, it was just uh, <laughs> no. video of my rear end. So um, didn't make it for a good video, but it made for a good hunt Great for me. story, that's, too. Yeah, that's funny. Those are the days when they were doing the Longbeard Madness series, I believe, and, and they were still doing writer's camps, uh, which is probably what you – I don't know if they had anybody else in at that time, but usually they would cycle through a few different writers from the publications and you know, like photographers and, and the things of those natures because he was mad calls. He was still, they were still heavily promoting and mm -hmm. developing and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff with, with that brand. So yeah, that's a, uh, th that's a good story. I had no idea that, that there was that connection back then. That was before yeah, my actually, day. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was, um, they had, I was there like opening weekend. I don't know why they didn't have anybody else that, that first weekend. I, I, I don't know if they thought it would take that, you know, I needed opening day to be able to get me a turkey or whatever the situation was. But uh, they had Philip Borgeli, oh, yeah. who's the one of the shotgun editors at uh, Field and Stream. He came in after that. And um, um, a guy from Masio came in, uh, Kevin Tate yep. uh, was there. I met him kind of at the end of it. Uh, but I was there. I was the only guy with wow. Mark terry and coon dog it was the three of them Jeez. and it was in this little little cabin that you know coon, it was coon dog's lease yeah hunting lease and he invited me to come back and photograph deer i think uh, he had shot a big body deer they? the year before i think what's they, that i think they called that little cabin the birdhouse maybe or the uh, they had a name maybe. for it yeah we the, we actually filmed the first uh the first episode of dream season the first year of dream season we the, everybody stayed at that little camp mm. uh, and and i think kundog had that lease with several other cops that he police officers and and things of that nature but yeah that's that's a great area up there too not only for turkey but great deer hunting area uh but he, he doesn't have that lease anymore the bird i think it was the bird house is what they called it Some, something like that might have been that was 20 you know what 20 almost 23 years ago now yeah. And I, I've got very fond memories of your dad or uh, your uncle. Um, you know, Mark picked me up at the uh, the uh, Columbia, Missouri airport and uh, we he drove over there or drove us over there. And he had a little green Toyota uh, four by four pickup. And he had, you know, had all these calls that he had brought me to use and stuff like that. And I remember him and I got photos of it, of him sitting in the back of that truck 
tuning all my calls, the box calls and slate calls and making marks. And I still got those marks on those calls. Cool. And I still use those to call turkeys today, 20 something years later. I, I, it's the, like their big call at the time was the illuminator. Yep. I yeah, think yeah. was, uh, their, their aluminum slate call. Yeah. And, um, anyway, it was, you know, it was like cutting edge. And I remember they had the dog whistle deal at the time. <laughs> that was, that was a big deal, you know, <laughs> That's uh, a to point get of turkeys to, <laughs> to sound off. No, so anyway, I'm really dating myself, but, uh, yep. Anyway, that was uh, really cool to hang out with those guys because we had the afternoons every day to just kind of hang out in camp. Yeah. And uh, when I finally, you know, I shot my turkey. And so we did photos of that with Terry holding it and Mark holding it. And I've got some of those published in magazines. I don't remember which magazines. But anyway, that was uh, way back in the day. Uh, it was a lot of fun with That's those guys. That's pretty cool. Crazy. Well, we appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Well, let's hop into our real wild clip. And and by the way, Lance, if you are if you're good on time, you're welcome to hang out. If you got a if you got a jet, you can. No, I'd I'd love to love hanging out with you guys. Okay. Well, our, our boy Ben here in studio was out doing some uh, doing some hunting here late season and came across this interesting canine. All right. So here's the real wild clip of the day. All right, so Whoa. we're we're in a, like a old quarry or something here, and we're looking at a coyote that's only got he's missing his front leg. He's it's just something's kind of dangling off yeah, that front leg, he, like a little bone there and some hide that's hang, that's hanging there. It's his front right leg, and he's he's a tripod coyote, and it it probably got caught in a leg trap. That's what I was thinking, but he's navigating some not easy terrain there yeah. for a three-legged animal. And he looks awful healthy, too, so it yeah. doesn't look like he's starving. Yeah, yeah, so this this pretty crazy-looking clip. I've, I've never seen that before. No, and I mean, it's just amazing how adaptable those animals are. Yeah, yeah, so there's your real wild clip of the day. Pretty crazy. Uh, discounted because he only had three legs. <laughs> Okay, we got a question of the day. We don't know who this individual is. They this, they left us a question of the day on our. You just hit the link in the show notes and it takes you to our voice voicemail <laughs> recording service. This person just left a uh, just an anonymous question. All right, do I have this on my? Okay, yeah, I do. So all right, <laughs> do I really need to say the question of the day is brought to you by anything based on the question that we have? All right, the question of the it's day is brought to you by. Parcel data and DeerCast maps. Find out who owns ground in any state and maybe score yourself some new hunting spots this season. I'm actually working on that as we speak. Ooh. <laughs> and I would recommend anybody out there that needs a new spot to hunt to get on it right now. Now is the time to do if it. If you can find a new spot, you could still scout it and pick up some great intel right now before green green up happens in the spring. Mm -hmm. So now is the shed hunting. Yeah, on it. now is the perfect time to find a new piece. All right, so here is this question. And this is not really a question. This is Tim being a jokester here. How do I enter a contest? So that was Tim. It wasn't me. <laughs> who so, added that ending who, to it? Well, who knows who did that? It's hard to tell. <laughs> wasn't me. With technology the way it is these so days. So basically, we, we had the contest going on, and like this was like at the end of the year, right? And this guy, he leaves an anonymous message. It just says, how do I enter a contest? And that yes, was it. But it's a great chance for us to talk <laughs> about the Tracker Off-Road giveaway that's happening right now in DeerCast. We actually have a ton of submissions already, too. Mm -hmm. And it just started in January. So we're giving away a Tracker 800 side-by-side. This thing is awesome. Uh, it's surprisingly quiet, which I think we talked about in the previous episode of the podcast. Mm -hmm. So Lots of quietness. it's free giveaway. All you got to do, it's free to enter. All you got to do is go over to DeerCast, and there's a giveaway tab in the lower right. Hit the giveaway tab, enter some info, and you are automatically entered in. That's how you enter a contest. Yeah, and there's only one chance per person. Yeah. yeah, so all right. Onward and upward. Okay, uh, Lance, the wildlife word, something we do every week. The guest gets to guess. It's multiple choice. The guest gets, gets to guess first. Um, it's one of the very polite things that Matt does. It's a <laughs> deferential thing. It's a way for me to cheat and usually pick <sighs> the thing you pick. That too. <laughs> so this week, the wildlife word is brought to you by DeerCast Fan Shares. Upload your successes from the field and share with other DeerCast users in the Fan Share feed. Just tap the filter button in the upper right hand corner of the DeerCast main page, select Fan Shares, and see what everybody's been up to. 
Okay, here we go. Osteoclasts. These are cells that remodel bone tissue in mammals. But in whitetails, they also do this. A, they don't exist because deer aren't mammals. Trick question. B, they sever the point of connection between the pedicle and the antler. C, they repair damaged optical tissue. Or D, they make tenderloins so dang tender. <laughs> All right, Lance, what do you got here, buddy? Well, uh, um, option A and option D look really, really tempting, uh, number one and number four. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to probably go with number two, the severing of the veins or whatever for you know, clotting at the burrs okay. or the bases of the antlers. I'd, I'd go with that. Okay. But I have never heard that word before in my life, so that's a guess. But I would think that would be a good good option for it and probably something that would be called. Way to talk through the answer. I am also going with B, and I don't – I mean, something about the osteo part of it made me think about the sever the point of connection there between the go. pedicle and the yeah. antler. Yeah, osteo so. typically means bone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So they, they are the actual cells that go in there and they say, clip this off. Huh. There you go. Osteoblasts create the bone tissue. I'll be damned. One of the best things, I, I had a, uh, a biology teacher in high school, one of the best things he ever did, he taught us all the Latin prefixes and suffixes. So you could pretty much look at any scientific word and break it down into its parts yeah. and figure out about what it means. It yeah, brilliant. Mine did the same thing, but he was also my driver's ed teacher, and I learned way more <laughs> on the driver's ed side than the biology side for not some very reason. Passionate about biology. I don't know. Could have been me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> okay, and then we, uh, we we so appreciate your guys' reviews for us. Uh, we had uh, Tyler V18 over on Apple Podcasts. He gave us five stars. He titled his review 100% Shenanigans. Uh -oh. I thoroughly enjoy listening every week on my Wait but you don't say that. <laughs> Not only is it a good time, but also with, informa with information put out. I wouldn't say much, but it will get you by. Sarcasm. I love the show and look forward to it every week. Keep up the good work, Matt and Tim. Let's all have a good season in 2023. God bless, and I'll be listening. Thanks, well, Tyler. I appreciate the, uh, the feedback, buddy. Yeah, Thank you. Great. All right, so we're down to the final piece here, Lance. Every week uh, we have a thing called the Rack Pack. It's over on Facebook. It's a private Facebook group. It's kind of Very for like private. the listeners and the followers of, of the podcast. And every week we got a bunch of new members. Tim lists some names out. I, I read the names aloud. And every week there's a fake name somewhere mixed mm -hmm. in here that I got to – Got to sniff out. Mm. Also, every week I butcher most of these names. Mm -hmm. All right, so here we go. We got Brandon Baston. Mm, he's mm. French. He is. Uh, Cody and Crystal Baines. Uh oh. Uh, the dual uh, Facebook uh, uh, account. Uh, 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 Somebody messed who up. Who could it be? Is it Cody or Crystal? I just we saw another know. meme about, <laughs> about this. I should have shared it into the rack pack because it just totally roasts the, <laughs> nice. the, the dual <laughs> citizenship Facebook page. I've got a, I've got a friend, a, a neighbor who's a friend that has one of these, and I never know who is. Yeah. Running it. Well, the common misconception, or maybe it isn't, but is that someone cheated on somebody else, and so now they <laughs> yeah. have a, a joint <laughs> Facebook This is how account. we rectify but this. And I think in our um, demographic, it's that the guy doesn't know how to work Facebook, and he's just like, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, I'll be on yours. <laughs> Honey, can you run my Facebook for me? Let me on that email. there Facebook. All right, we got Ooh. James Lewis. We got Randy Braunecker. Braunecker? Ooh, that Braunecker? Good. Braunecker. That has to be it. Bronicker. Let's go with it. <laughs> All right. I found the fake one. I'm a dumb idiot. <laughs> oh, don't say that about yeah. yourself. I'm a, he spelled it I'm a, and then dumb idiot. <laughs> dumb idiot. <laughs> Nathaniel Frick. That could be fake. Bill Davidson. Cameron Freshour. Cade Bubella. Ooh, it's mm. almost like a, a spread for a. <laughs> Brubella. <laughs> or a discharge. All right, that's it. Ugh. Well, you should have the last name of Kruger and uh, grow up in the late 1980s when uh, oh, Nightmare yeah. on Elm Street was a big deal. Uh -oh. yeah. I got lots of Freddy Krueger jokes <laughs> and prank calls by little girls on Friday nights. Uh -huh. I to know if Freddy Krueger was there. So, Man. yeah, imagine having Kruger as your back last name. Yeah, that's annoying. 
Imagine <laughs> the having calls, an, I'm saying. Imagine having an unpronounceable last name. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Tim's last name? <laughs> I've seen it, but I can't. I won't even try to pronounce it. No, no, it. give it your best shot. <laughs> I would have to see it here in front of me. It's like, because school or something. Or? <laughs> I love that. Oh, yeah. school. I like that. Stephen Kajiskel. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. I, I can I can get your fr- first name, but your last name. That's yeah, Tim. I, I, mm-hmm. <laughs> being a Texan, I have a hard enough time pronouncing most things. So, yeah. well, Tim, do you want to tell him what it is? Chelsvik. How many letters are silent in this? <laughs> All of them. Yeah. Just Chel- uh, Chelsvik. Yep. Bet yep. you would have never Unless guessed so that. The, so there's a K in there, mm-hmm. but the J after it, the K silent. If you were in Norland, it would make complete sense. I don't think ah. that some of our own employees know how to say your last name. No. no. I know one that I can think of. <laughs> Outdoor writer. <laughs> so. My wife's Scandinavian. She's half Norwegian, so she would probably uh, oh, there do you go. a good job at it. Heck yeah. Well, man, yep. we appreciate you jumping on with us today. It's fascinating what you do. You're a hell of a, obviously the best and one of the best out there in the business and, and to continue to evolve and, you know, show your imagery now on a different platform and kind of bring in a bunch of new eyeballs to, to what it is that you do. It's fascinating to me to be able to get up close and personal like you do. You have to be one of the best hunting non-hunting hunters i know <laughs> i mean the, the images that you take are second to none man well thank you very much you know it's it's part of it is because i get on places that most people mm-hmm. don't get to get on yeah with a gun you know and the other thing is remember i am showing photos that i have shot over years on instagram people people are always thinking that every photo that i post I just shot it and I'm posting it from the blind <laughs> Good point. Yeah. But that's not the way it is. Uh, the photos that y'all are seeing on Instagram are like the great days from 20 something years. Mm. And, you know, specifically I, I went to digital in 2007. So this is uh, 2022. So 15 years that have been digital photographs. Those are easier to share than my old slides that I have to scan and all that. Mm. So, I'm not posting as I'm shooting these photos. Some of these photos are 10 years old, five years old stuff. I shot last season. You're not seeing what I'm posting, what I'm shooting as I post it. So just so that I don't have to respond to all the hundreds of messages I get from everybody every week that, you know, man, you shot that big buck this afternoon. That's awesome. I shot that five years ago. So just know (laughs) that all that stuff is previous photos. I don't even look at the photos until the next spring when i shoot everything that i shot this year Mm -hmm. this fall and winter i'm not even going to look at it until this spring getting it ready for the magazines in the summertime when they're asking for the photos for the fall issues so anyway so just so that people don't think you know they're seeing the great days Mm -hmm. i figure for every 12 days that i'm out i have one great day in 12 days and two good days but there's nine days where i get nothing so there's nothing to even share with people Ugh. even Sounds you know there's like no season. megapixels were shot on that day i can relate to this yes. but it was actually 12 out of 12 days for me Ugh, <laughs> clean sweep here <laughs> had a tough year <laughs> but yeah you, you know what the parallels to what we do are you know we're sharing the best the highlight reels you know hour point. of maybe 10 days of footage yeah that's it, there's a lot of parallels there to what you're doing and what we're doing the only difference really being the the actual shot at the end so um i'm sure when we're looking at the same type of factors and weather variables that kind of we produce you know the algorithm for deer cast with you're probably studying all that same stuff in a different way because you're trying to pick your best days to go you know to go film mm-hmm. or to well go- because i'm on the road honestly i i got to go out no matter what Oof. because every day is costing me x number of hundreds or you know thousands of dollars per day to be able to be in that spot because, you know, we actually homeschool our four kids so that they can go with me on my photo shoots around the United States. And so all six of us load up in my suburban and we make a run for, you know, let's say a month. I've got to photograph and be productive every day, whether it is great conditions or if it's crappy conditions. And I've got to go out, whether it's raining, sleeting. I mean, if it's dangerous, I might not go out, but I have not had many of those in, in my life Can't call where I'm not going to go out. So I'm 
constantly learning because I'm forced to go out every day and not cherry pick my days, what deer do in the worst of conditions. Yeah. And so you're going to, you know, learn a lot when you're doing that, especially when you're up close to deer and getting to observe them at close range and you're not firing at the first one shooting, you know, the first buck that comes out Mm -hmm. and you're getting to see interactions between deer and see different ages of deer and see how each deer has a different look to their face, just like humans do. Most people don't know that. I mean, there's so many things that a camera will extend your season and will give you reason even after you fill your tags to go learn about deer. So I really recommend people, even if they get a cheapo camera or even a, a, a cell phone camera, just shooting video from a blind, work on trying to get them up close. And so that's, that's something that will teach you more than any kind of magazine article, any YouTube video will by going out and just spending time in the field. That's my mantra, time in the field. That's why I'm so successful because I've got to be out there every day. And I'm not just going to, you know, the, the hunting property down the road from me. I'm going wherever big whitetails are. I, I put, you know, in four months' time, I'll put 40,000 miles in my Suburban and, you know, hit 18 U.S. states and three or four Canadian provinces. So I'm going past a lot of places that aren't good trying to go to those great places. Yeah. And even then, I still only have one great day out of 12 mm. and two good days out of that 12. The man is hustling. <clears throat> That's a good – He's got a great point there. That's what people should take away from this. Yeah. <laughs> to I'm kill good deer, great deer, it takes a lot of time, a lot of time in a stand sometimes. And even then. <laughs> and even then it's not a, <laughs> yeah. So, and the right. number one factor that is the most important of all is to not shoot them when they're young. Don't shoot them when they're one or two years old and think you're going to kill a big buck. Because if you are shooting them one or two years old, those are your potential future trophies that when they mature at five years old, six years old, That's people ask me all the time. How, what's your secret? How can I see big bucks on my property? I tell them number one, time in the field, spending time out there. Number two, don't kill them when they're young. Let them mature, have trigger control. People management is far more important than deer management. Mm. That's a good, good way to put it. Brought to you by people cast. (laughs) All right. We appreciate it, man. We'll, uh, we'll link up all, you know, er everywhere that somebody can find or follow you in our show notes here. Uh, if they're listening at home, where's, uh, what's your Instagram handle? Lance underscore Kruger. I think it is. Yep. And like I said, we'll link it up too. So we really appreciate your time today and, uh, just keep up the great work out there. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Y'all were fun to hang out with for a little while. All right, Thanks, guys. Until next time, peace out. See ya. DeerCast is now supercharged with maps. Get ahead of your game with killer new features like live Doppler radar, wind check out to five days, virtual rain gauges, GPS path tracking, and more. Plus, get our 14-day revolutionary DeerCast prediction and access to DeerCast track. Prep, predict, and pursue with DeerCast. We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This episode of DOD TV was brought to you by Leupold. 